So welcome to the Paragone podcast. My name is Robert Yeo and I'm joined by my fellow co-hosts. We've got Richard, we've got Robin and we've got Simon. This is a new podcast and in each episode we're going to delve into and explore the lazy thinking that we see going on in the world of tech, social, politics and the future. And like the Paragone stage debates in the Renaissance times, we want to debate, discuss and no doubt argue about the relative merits of the topics that we're focusing on. So the topic for today is should our children go to university? And now we're recording this episode in it's early October 2022, which is very timely as all first year undergraduates, freshers as we call them here in the UK, started their courses in the past couple of weeks. And I believe even Oxford and Cambridge with, with their shorter eight week terms have started by now as well. Now, my eldest child is actually at university. They started uh, two weeks ago and they're officially an undergraduate. And actually, for the rest of you guys, we've I think, if I remember correctly, everyone's got a, an eldest child potentially starting or making this decision whether to start in the next year or two. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah right. that's right. OK, so therefore, we've clearly got skin in the game and, and it's very important to us. So I'm going to hand over to Simon, who's going to get us started on this uh, on this topic. Yeah, th thanks, Rob. So, so the key thing here, I think, is the assumption was built up over the last kind of 30, 40 years in the UK um, that everyone needs to go to university to do well in life. And that is, there's a lot of unintended consequences that have come from um, various political decisions made in the 90s about more people going to university. But the key thing is actually, do you need to really go? And my eldest is, um, she's doing a GCSEs next year. She's thinking about which A-levels to do. She's thinking about, you know, does she go to university? Which university? And actually, it's quite a challenging subject to un unpick for her because whether or not people want to go to university, actually, the push for so many A-level students to go to university has meant that many jobs actually now need a degree, which they didn't do before. So the risk is, well, if you don't go to university, does that restrict the jobs you can go into? If you do go to university, you take on a lot of debt. You're missing out maybe on earning in, in the first three, four years of your career. So you, you load up a lot of debt. But actually then, because it's now so competitive in the job market, you potentially end up with um, going into jobs where you, you know it's a non-graduate job. You're not getting paid a huge amount. So there's so much competition for those jobs, it's difficult to get one. So it's, it's really trying to figure out for her and for everybody really, actually, is what about that default assumption? Does everybody need to go to university to do well in life, to get a good job? Simon, you mentioned debt. What's some numbers here? So we give our audience some context and some understanding of actually the sums involved. Yeah. Okay. So every everybody's um, sort of debt level, what, what they can afford to from their parents or they take on is different. But I think there's a stat. I think Rob, if you can share it, that mm -hmm. the average undergraduate debt in the UK is something like forty five thousand now. Yeah, that's it. So and that's the growth as you know fees have been introduced for courses, cost of living's gone up, all of those things. So you're looking at taking on average kind of fifteen k a year, forty five k after three years. Then on top of that, you've got the first three years of your career. You know, obviously salaries differ, but if you went, to, if you, the average salary of a school leaver, I think is something like nineteen or or twenty grand a year. So you start looking at that, and you take the on forty five grand of debt, maybe another fifty grand of income you missed out. So kind of thick end of a hundred grand is is the real kind of cost and opportunity cost to going to university. That's a pretty significant sum of people leaving, you know, leaving university and getting jobs. So okay, you can get a job a hundred grand a year, maybe as magic circle lawyer, but actually the you know the average graduate salary is probably something like 28 29 thousand so it's quite it's quite a difficult trade and i don't want to necessarily bring it all down to money because there's obviously there's a huge number of other benefits from going to university but it's what are those benefits from going to university that offset the cost yeah it's not and, just the, the forty five thousand in debt it's the interest payments as well which i believe are relatively high and actually what would be quite interesting is i don't know what's going to happen to those those interest payments now the interest rates on these student loans now that we're seeing a you know significant increase in the rate the base rate from the bank of england right whether those are also going up materially yeah the interest is rpi plus three percent i think um on um, those student loans however we should note i think because inflation is so high the government in the uk has introduced a cap that maybe limits it to high single digits certainly at the moment and there is this payment mechanism, isn't it? You don't actually pay any interest until you you reach a certain level of Correct. earnings, which is some some level, I think, low twenty grand. Yeah, but your 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 interest is obviously continuing to build up, I guess. So if you don't start work for ten years at a level where you're earning enough money, you still build up ten years of interest at those pretty high rates of interest. 
It's yeah, like an interest only mortgage, isn't it? But the, the money is taken at source, though, isn't it, from your salary? So it's kind of like an additional tax in, yeah. your, in your pay slip. So some of the readings I did, some people were saying, well, you know, it, therefore it doesn't matter because you're only ever going to pay what you can afford each month. Whereas others are like, well, yeah, but coming back to the point that Rob was making, those interest rates could become quite, with the economic environment as we have now, those interest rates could actually become quite punitive. So while you're only paying while you're earning, the amount you're paying is not fixed as a percentage of your earnings. For our audience and for perhaps our audience that don't have children at the ages of of mid to late teens or uh, um, that therefore it's really relevant is they may not actually understand what the costs are because we talked about average student debt. So the costs are broken down into three different things. There's there's the tuition fees, and this is capped by and set by the government, right? That's £9,250 a year. Technically, that's the maximum universities can charge. So guess what they all did? They yeah. charged £9,250 per year. Yeah. Then there is the average cost or the typical cost of living, which is accommodation and food. My daughter's paying towards the high end of six to eight thousand pounds a year. Well, actually, it's eight thousand pounds. So now you're already over seventeen thousand pounds a year. And that's before books, going out, clubs, socializing more broadly. So it's not it's not excessive to thinking you're you're paying eighteen, nineteen, twenty thousand pounds per year. Yeah, it's really twenty grand a year because you know you've got the the compulsory books that you need to buy all written by the lecturers so you know you end up funding the lecturers i don't know if that's what your experience was that certainly was mine every year i was at university i had to buy you know seven or eight books every one of them was was written by you know one of the lecturers teaching teaching the course so yeah i think you know with all of the the things that are going on now in in freshers week you know freshers balls freshers passes and stuff like that and then you've got this going on every year you know, and then you've got the end of year stuff as well. You're, you're really getting up to, you know, 20,000 quite, quite easily, I think. Yeah. So, so 60,000 for a three year degree. And that's where the roughly you get 45 grand of, of, of average debt. Although I suspect mm-hmm. it's Lee, I'm surprised it's that low unless the bank of mum and dad are providing the money. So, so guys, what, you know, it's probably a good thing to, to mention and, and discuss is who of us have actually been to university because that can give you know preconceived ideas as to whether our children should go to university and I know my parents didn't go to university um, and only one of their generation across my my parents both my mum and my dad only one of them did actually go to university of their siblings but yes I did go to university I didn't necessarily find it a particularly beneficial experience um, and think that I may have been um, as successful or more successful had I had I not gone to university. But I think there's a very important distinction to to make now when I went to university, university was free. Um, now, students are coming out with all the tuition debt, which is, which is obviously quite considerable. So even if you said the living expenses, you know, you had living expenses back in the early 90s, and you've got a living expenses now and you excluded those, you still have, you know, what now what is it, you know, 50% extra cost is the cost of the tuition fees. I, I went to university as well in the early 90s. So yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. So I, I went to I went to university, did, did a geography degree, and then you basically either become a I guess there's still jobs for map makers and things, or you become a uh, geography teacher, or you become an accountant. So whilst I really enjoyed my time at university, it was just a credential to go and get a job with you know one of the one of the big four accountancy firms. Mm. I didn't go to university. I wanted to go to university, but um, circumstances at the time prevented me uh, from going to university. Um, but actually, I think not going to university turned out to be the best thing for me and and my career. And that has coloured my opinion of university throughout the rest of my life. And I've got quite uh, opposing views on why you should go to university, uh, which obviously we'll be, we'll be looking at in this conversation. Another, another interesting thing is whose degree is actually been relevant to their career. I mean, I did a degree in computer science at university and have gone on to do a, a degree in the IT sector um, before starting my own businesses. So my, my degree was relevant, although because I'd also done, you know, a, I'd actually done a BTEC, which is the equivalent of three A-levels, because I'd also done 
and that in computer science, I felt that I was repeating certain elements of my of, of my topic throughout each of my you know sets of education, basically. How much that was was taught to you during the university degree? How much of it was just stuff you did kind of outside the degree you'd done anyway? So you, you were interested in quite a bit was taught by myself. Um, there was a, the theoretical side was definitely was definitely taught on on the degree and also you know, prior on on the on the BTEC. So, uh, but I would say you know what I use in the real world now, I would suggest that the majority of it was self-taught, not actually learned on on degree, the things that are of value. A lot of computer science degrees, they teach you, you know, theory, but they're not teaching you what is actually relevant to the mm. real world, if that makes sense. But did, did the degree teach you how to think as well as the theory? No, I don't think so. My, my degree taught a lot of maths in the first and second year, which was was a surprise to me. But, you know, subsequently, I think I've, I've come to the conclusion they, that degrees are doing a lot of maths uh, in the first and second year on the science subjects, because it's it's a good way of assessing somebody's academic intel- intelligence. I think my I'd already learned to think through my um, A-level equivalent, my BTEC, that had really, I was very lazy at school, um, so I didn't do very well at all at school. Um, but I had a real rude awakening and I went, when I went to college and did my BTEC. And, you know, really had to sort of knuckle down and, you know, learn and learn to research and and do things like that. I don't really think my university um, taught me taught me that Um, it maybe emphasized it and and built on it. But I I think, you know, I could have done that, you know, more in the real world. Right. And to clarify, the 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 the, the, there's some terms we're referencing, BTEC and A-levels. They're what we refer to as further education. That's what we do after secondary school. Secondary school stops at 16. We then have uh, further education, which is 17, 18. And actually, you can do it at 19 as well. It is free, 100% free. Uh, living costs, one presumes you're at, you're living with your parents still. And then we go on to university, the subject of this conversation, which we which we, which we refer to as higher education. And, and just to complete that point, so three of us, so 75% of this little cohort went to university. I did a physics degree, same as Simon. It was very much a um, uh, credential that helped me get a job at a uh, what was then a big six accounting firm, which is now big four, which is Deloitte's, Ernst & Young, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Who's the fourth now? I was going to say, you're showing your age because I forgot it was big four back then. And now we can't remember. Not, now we can't oh. remember. It's K- KPMG, EY, um, PwC and Deloitte's. Deloitte's, right. We were big six, but Anderson's went the way of the dodo because of Enron and then Coopers and Librand. Uh, and, P- and Price Waterhouse merged at the time. So we're seventy five percent. What's the for again? What's what's the typical? What's the what's the percentage of eighteen year olds that go to university here in the UK? Then. So I think that's that's an interesting stat, and that the stats and stats. But one of the things I saw was nineteen eighty. In, in 1980 in the UK, 15% of um, students went, went on to any form of further education, so further education, higher education, training, um, and that grew to about 25% in 1990. And, and, and this isn't kind of a political thing, in a, it, um, but you need to look at the politics of this. 92, as John Major, I think, his government said, right, we should, we should, you know, everybody, lots more people should go to university. So what happened? The old colleges, the old polytechnics were all rebranded to to university which is fine you know that um, institutes of higher education etc moved and then when Blair came to power in 97 he set a target of um, 50% of uh, uh, school leavers going on to university and I think I think that was reached in about 2019 so that's been right. that's been the kind of the long run in the UK has been that that push into uh, students being pushed into university i guess the question is do do plumbers electricians bricklayers you know carpenters roofers you know all these these people do they need to go to university so you know are we sending people to university then building up this debt they yes they get a life experience but is is it the right thing to be doing or should you know should the uk be following you know the approach of company countries like germany and others where they have a different approach to you know higher education yeah that's an interesting one because it also depends on the subject of course right because if you're if you know you not you don't need a degree in plumbing but you do need real you know practical experience on the job training all the safety stuff but then you could also say that actually in Lots of other jobs, like any you know, knowledge work, for example, if you work in the professional services industry, it, whatever degree you go and do, if you go and work for just taking you know, Rob, Rob and me working at PwC, you still need to go and do your accountancy training. Mm-hmm. And actually, in the olden days, I mean, a long time ago, in the 30s, whenever it was, 
you'd go in as an article clerk, actually the accounting firms nowadays, because there's such a war for talent, it's so difficult to get people, they're actually looking to getting school leavers again, put them through a more junior form of a better word, qualification, then they can do that for three years, then they move on to the full accounting qualification. So actually, you know, even the accounting firms has gone full circle in a way. Yeah, I mean, if you go back far enough, the accountants were charging the... Uh the graduates to to do the qualification and now it's gone completely the opposite around isn't it i'm just not convinced that the, the vast majority of people that have graduated are actually using anything they've learned from their degree in the real world and um and i think that's you know three years of somebody's life that could that could be better spent basically you know rather than building up debt actually earning some money and building actually relevant skills to their industry sector yeah definitely look you, you you've hired loads of i guess tech graduates or interviewed loads of tech graduates yeah. um i mean how, how did you got how did you guys see a university degree was it was it just a credential as as rob said or was it was it valuable how did you figure out who to who was best to hire <laughs> yeah I've, I've interviewed in thousands of people in my career and and hired hundreds uh, many hundreds and when i was you know looking at cvs and stuff i used to pay very little attention to their education and in fact actually to the to the latter stage of my when I owned my company, I actually turned around to the recruitment department and said, I, "I'm send me the CV, but I'm not going to actually look at it until the, you know, just before the interview. What I want to know is the, how this person rates their skills out of 10 in the relevant technologies that they're going to be using in their job. So it was always harder when you were interviewing more junior people, but certainly the, the mid-level and seniors, it was a very, very good guide because people tend not to want to overestimate themselves, make themselves look an idiot or underestimate themselves because otherwise they won't get the job. So we would look at the skills, you know, which would take all of like 30 seconds, make an assessment as to whether we're going to interview that person. And then, you know, before the before the interview, we would look at the CV and use that as a, a to, to extract more from the interview. But we would test people at the interview um, we were hiring for developers and um, testers typically, but we also did hire project managers and, and and alike. But when we were when we were hiring for programmers, it was very very easy to, to determine whether somebody was a good programmer or not. But we would never rely on their prior experience, even if they had ten years prior experience, even if they had a degree. We wouldn't rely on that, even if it was a master's or PhD. We would ultimately test them, and it was a standardized test. We would give the same test to you know, junior developers and senior developers. And based on the results of that test would, and the interview that followed is what we would use to, to hire that person. So whether they had a, they'd spent three years at university and 10 years in their career, it was, it was irrelevant. We were, you know, we were hiring people based on what, you know, their ability to, you know, do a real world programming test, basically. Obviously, I have a similar career to, to Richard. So I've hired hundreds of software engineers and the other staff that go into an engineering organization like project managers and business analysts and stuff like that over the years. And there would always be a technical test element but you wouldn't be hired on the strength of your technical test you would be not hired if you completely flunked it but passing the technical test was not a guarantee of being hired we then moved to what we call soft skills is the cultural fit because gaps in your technical skills can be overcome if you're a cultural mismatch that's never going to get fixed and so we actually i actually hired quite a lot of graduates with varying degrees of technical competency but i didn't really care about their technical competency because i learned quite early on that people who had graduated with a computer science degree even if it was a first their actual real world application of those skills was appalling and so we would spend the first 3 months of them having been hired actually training them how to be an effective software engineer in the real world as opposed the theoretical stuff that they get taught in university. To begin with, I was quite disillusioned. It kind of validated my belief at the time that going to university was a complete waste of time with some exceptions, like if you want to go and do law or medicine or, or something like that. Just a couple of things that are really interesting, actually. So I always, I mean, I, I've managed and worked with a bunch of developers, but I, I'm like a code a bit in SQL, but not, not much else. And I've probably forgotten that now. But developers, you've got the 1x or the 3x or the 10x developers, so the, the developer is 10 times better than the standard developer. D d are those tests what you're trying to get to to find to find those kind of people or is it it's really to establish a baseline of their technical competency yeah. and yeah. to understand when you then combine that with how well they do in the sort of the cultural parts of the interview is this person going to be a good fit they're going to fit in with the team and can those gaps in their technical skills be overcome by integrating well into the team 
and if if we think they are then 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 they'll get hired yeah the the test is like a barrier to getting into the the interview and then Mm -hmm. we used to use the technical test output to um as part of the interview process as well so we would say well you know why have you done something a particular way you know from the technical test you can see whether the person has has understood the problem whether whether they understand the programming language they're using do they have a tendency to overcomplicate things which is just as bad right as being making a substandard solution if you overcomplicate it it can be very difficult for another developer to, to pick yeah, up yeah. and then as robin said in the interview you know we, we would focus on you know cultural fit but one thing that i used to focus on heavily when interviewing people was if they gave me um, an incorrect answer to a question that I asked them and I felt that I couldn't read them in, in the future. So I, I knew that they didn't know the answer, but I could tell that they were, but they were saying it very confidently. If they did that in the real world and I didn't know the answer, then I may get misled. And I was always looking to see whether I could actually read the candidate to make sure that if they are given an answer and it is a hunch rather than something they categorically know, can I read that and, and therefore, you know, apply a different weighting to the to the output or follow it up in some other way? So, so that's really interesting. So is, is that, that I mean, that's kind of like just getting back up onto university mm-hmm. specifically, it's kind of working backwards from there. So actually the problem is that maybe it's firms find it difficult to have, therefore you need credentials. And that's what the universities are kind of kind of selling people. I think paraphrasing Brian Kaplan, who wrote a really good book called um, The Case Against Education, it's something along the lines of everyone leaves school, university eventually. Most of what you learn kind of doesn't matter anyway. If you did learn something and you, you don't use it, you're probably going to forget. So, and, and a lot of the time you're finding kind of irrelevant information is being taught to kind of people who aren't particularly interested. So actually, what is it that university is really doing? Some degrees, absolutely medicine, it takes a long time to learn. You need to start early and get there. The kind of the work I do, you need to have hard and soft skills, but it's much more a way of thinking about the world and and figuring things out and asking, so what? So so for us, actually, university degree, MBA, it's not actually that relevant. It's much more down to, as you talking about, the kind of the the candidates and the, and the testing. But then if, if universities aren't really teaching kind of real world skills, Skills, but they are kind of giving credentials is that is that enough is, is that plus the experience going to university is that enough think, people to go i think it varies by your what type of course you're doing i think for computer science which is the industry that you know robin and i come from you can just learn everything and the university courses you know on youtube and stuff like that and, and pretty much the university courses and are mostly out of date and trailing behind in, in some ways but then back onto the testing subject and interestingly most universities aren't testing candidates when they apply to university you know oxford and cambridge test every candidate by sounds of things but a lot of universities are not and interestingly the universities that are testing it tends to vary obviously on the course that the person's doing it, it looks like that the people that have been tested are mostly doing things like the, the subjects that are going to be going on to be doctors and dentists and stuff like that mm. which is quite interesting even nursing people have been tested for you know nursing qualifications so it, it is those long subjects where they're going to actually you know you don't go to university to be a doctor then to go off and be you know an accountant typically right so it, it is quite interesting that there seems to be a, a correlation between the, the subject you're doing usually and whether your likelihood of carrying on doing that in the future as well. Uh, well, there's several really good points there. Universities don't test. So mm. excluding Oxbridge, excluding medicine, universities, they hire or, or, or select students based on your predicted grades, your personal statement, and a letter of reference. That's mm. it. And, and your GCSE grades, I guess. GCSE well, grades right? now as well. Uh, I mean, yeah. sure. You... Uh, UCAS points is it's yeah. generally referred to, but those mm. are the three things. Oxford to Oxford and Cambridge definitely do interview, and then they have their own tests. Mm. But the others, they they do not. Um, so they are they are one hundred percent relying upon what what has been put in front of them, which is three things. Which, to be fair, does supply a lot of information outside of these are the grades, these are the subjects you've studied. But taking you guys back, so I, I'm, I'm hearing like two really key things about what perhaps is missing from the graduates. The typical graduate is missing the technical skills at a level they need. I think I heard that. But is that not because, so in computer science, maybe they have the technical skills, maybe they don't have the technical skills that you want if you're hiring for computer science. I suppose if I did physics, if I carried on down that route, well, I would have had the technical skills to go to the next stage and work in a, a laboratory or perhaps mm. do a PhD. I very much viewed it as a foundation because mm. 
And I think I'm just going to bring us back. How, how, how many people know what they want to do uh, when you apply for university, which really starts when you're selecting your A-levels? So here in the mm-hmm. UK, we force our teenage children into selecting a career quite early on. Now, mm. that's that's why if you do medicine, OK, there is a route, there is a path. Uh, you have to take these A-levels. You then have to take these tests and then you have to do this degree in this very small number of universities. But more generically, it's another credential. It's a badge. It's knowledge. Therefore, I selected a degree physics that was mass heavy technically heavy therefore i knew if i got a reasonable degree coming out of it it would be viewed in that way and i could ultimately choose from a number of different careers that i hadn't decided on what i wanted to do at that stage so you touch on the notes that i made about how to sort of present an argument here on whether you should go to university or not based on what you want to do I was sort of running a thought experiment on my own if you like last night trying to validate or challenge this assertion which is should you go to university i wrote down if it gives the best access to your career then yes i.e a vocational course now there are other ways to become a lawyer or an accountant um but going to university is by far the most efficient way to get there but it it does rely on you knowing that that's what you want to do, mm-hmm. um, at least going into university. So my elder son, who's in his A-levels a year at the moment, he's known for five years that he wants to be a lawyer. And so he wants to read law. My younger son, who's very similar to me, he excels at the digital learning and other related topics like maths and stuff like that at school. But he has no idea what he actually wants to do. So he's nearly 15 and he's got no idea whether he even wants to go to university or not so quite quite similar to me mm. in many respects that then led me down the path of okay so if you look at academic topics like english history latin greek and i mentioned latin and greek for reasons which we'll come to in a moment why did you go to university to read those how are they linked to a career at all they're not linked to a career okay. path at all and so what are the benefits from a technical perspective are there any benefits of going to university to read subjects like that or is it really about the social and experiential benefits that you go to read to Uh, subjects like that but then I looked at the save the student article and I realized that there are a couple of interesting famous people who are very successful who did go to university and read some surprising subjects so for example we have Chris Martin the lead singer of Coldplay he went to UCL University of College London and he read Greek and Latin which has had nothing to do with his career but had he not gone to university he would never have met the people that then became Coldplay Mm. and so that social and experiential benefit is very strong. And then you have Rowan Atkinson, who went and read electrical engineering at Newcastle before going on to do his master's at Oxford. I've no idea what his master's was in, but obviously it was his time at Oxford where he fell in with the crowd, Mm. you know, the Richard Curtis's and all that kind of thing that set his career off as a comedian. But I don't think he ever intended to become a comedian. You wouldn't choose electrical engineering if you you actually wanted to become a comedian. This article is full of people who took a slightly odd path to their career, but all went to university as well. The point you're mentioning there Robin is that what university does and talking a positive here is you are put together with a large number of people of a similar age with a similar interest typically Correct. on your course exactly. but then you've obviously you've got other other opportunities with other people that you meet other things you can do drama classes outside of your core subject and what's quite interesting is I went back to my university and guest lectured about five years ago now and down at the bottom of the campus they built a, a massive entrepreneur center so students Students now are, whilst they're at university and doing their courses, you might have somebody who's doing psychology, somebody who's doing computer science, somebody who's doing engineering, somebody who's doing, I don't know, some kind of art or whatever it is. There's an opportunity for students to get together whilst at university and try and come up for an idea for a business. And that the universities are now creating incubators and bringing in mentors and, you know, supporting people through that process because they they want that success. I mean, you know, you can imagine a university going, we had a person here who ended up creating the next Facebook at, at Loughborough University or something on those lines. So I think that is a positive, you know, that you are around people of a similar age and you can build connections that may be of benefit to you. But, you know, to be honest with you, I don't keep in contact with anybody from my university or my course now. I did for a few years after I left university with somebody on my course, but I, you know, I haven't kept in contact with anybody else, frankly. Well, that, that, that was going to be one of my next points is how many people are still in regular contact with people they form relationships with at university from the people that I've canvassed not many more people seem to still be in touch with people from secondary school my wife is in contact with a a good friend she made at university but it is one friend 
it is, it is not a, a large you know group of people i quite i quite like the idea though that university is um whatever the cliche is right of passage it's a bridge to the adult mm-hmm. world it's that kind of point where you've got another three years to figure out okay you're gonna go and learn something whatever that thing is you're gonna be taught some sort of skills now whether universities really are teaching the things that you need a job kind of resilience you know team working time management I, I doubt they are that's not really what they, yeah. they are there for but it is about kind of gaining independence you've got the time to go and explore lots of other options that if you good at sports you want to go and do acting want to go and do drama whatever those things are you just can't do that when you've got a kind of full-time job so i think there's a lot you can get out of it we're clearly going to be meeting people and getting drunk a lot of the time as well which is part of the rights of passage of going to the yeah. adult worlds but i don't know for me it, it does come down to that career choice there's some things where you need to go you know medicine you spend a long time doing even even law you could do a degree and then go and do a law conversion course and even law firms now recruiting you know looking at how they get people in 18 you can see firms the same the degree doesn't matter it's just credential actually will go and hire smart school leaders i spent sort of 20 years working in the city and yes you've got lots of people who've done mbas and masters and phds and whatever and there are genuinely people who've done a phd in black holes or something that you interview them and think actually i'm just going to go outside and make tea now but equally there's a lot of people who you know you've got people from the school leavers from kind of essex kent north surrey there are loads and loads of people like that who left schools at 15 16 18 maybe they've got decent grades maybe they haven't but there's a huge demand for people like that still, despite all the automation and technology. There's still a huge amount of demand for people going into the sort of the middle and back offices of, of, of banks and you get paid a pretty decent job. You don't really need a degree, you just need you know, an aptitude, some sort of math to be able to communicate, be able to work hard. Like university doesn't really add to that. So whilst you do have a lot of grants in banks, of course you do. It's only really the, the last you know, 20 years that there's been that push for the bank seems hard and more gradual. So you just, you just mm. don't need it. When, when I went to university, I remember somebody, a lecturer saying fairly early on in the time that if you've passed your A-levels and the entry criteria for to get into that particular university, then there's no reason why you shouldn't attain a, a, your degree from that university. So it was almost like, if you're smart enough to get this in A-levels, then you're smart enough to get that in degrees. And I, I bet there's a huge correlation between the grades people get at A-level and then the grades they get at degree. So, you know, for instance, if if people have got um, a grade A star at, at, you know, um, at A-level or a grade A at A-level, the chances are they are going to get a first class uh, honours degree at the mm-hmm. end of it. If they've got grade Bs, they might be more likely to get two ones and, and so on. I think there's a, there's a huge correlation. What, you know, in terms of universities and the quality of their teaching, you'd have to see the uplift from there. How many people came in on grade Bs, but actually ended up with, you know, with firsts. But because the universities do set their own courses and they set their own exams, it's difficult to compare the grade from one university with that of another. Yeah, I'm going to share something on that because I think it's very, very relevant for, for, yeah. for this. You're talking about the grades, aren't you? You're talking about... Yeah. And just to clarify, the first is the top, the two one is the upper second class, that's the second, then you get two twos, lower second class, third, and a fail, I think, or pass, then fail. Yeah, so what that's shown there, essentially then, Rob, is that in 2019, I think it's actually got worse, actually, recently, hasn't it? In it has got worse recently. I haven't, I, I, I'll share that in a second, because COVID lockdowns have really generated a lot of grade inflation at yeah. GCC, at A-level, and at degree. Yeah. We should just describe this graph for people who are listening rather than watching. Yeah, so basically what this graph is showing is you've got the academic year across the bottom and then along the left-hand side, you've got the percentage of students who are coming away with the top two grades at university level. So in 2018-19, it it appears to show approximately 75% or so of people are getting the top two grades. That is just ridiculous. And when I went to university in in 1990, it was more like a bell curve. 10% got first and and 10% would first fail obviously there was a distribution in between a lot of people getting two twos a reasonable number getting two ones and then there's a much smaller number getting first class and and yeah i mean what you're showing here is just shocking right Uh, so in the last two years just to be clear for for people that aren't watching as well it's got a lot worse so over 80 percent of students graduating from their first degree are getting a first or a 2-1 and to be clear the first is what's ballooned these universities are setting their own degree uh, examinations and doing their own marking so a first from one establishment not really directly comparable to another i mean we do do that comparison for sure and so do employers 
but there's no unlike a levels and gccs there's no nationwide i believe i could be wrong need to be fact checked there's no nationwide normalization of grades here without sort of entering into the the students become a customer of university and in order for a university to be successful it needs to publish amazing grades so that it becomes attractive and so the cycle continues are students actually being exploited by the universities in kind of a dark nefarious way to fulfill the objectives of the university which are ultimately to increase their revenue which they do by attracting more students which they do by having great grades and those graphs um, just show that that mu there must be some truth to that because there is no other reason over 80 percent of students would now be getting the top two grades coming out of university that's just nuts as I said, there was used to be a bell curve. And so you'd, you'd get most people getting two twos, smaller number getting two ones, and then a small number getting first. But that was back in the days where the government was the customer, really. The mm -hmm. government was paying the universities for us to go to university back in the 90s. And they didn't have to pander so much to the, to the undergraduates. Now, the reality is the, the student is paying. You don't fail your customer. Mm -hmm. If you do, you know, you're not going to do very well going forward, right? So they, they are pandering to the student. Students. And there's, there's been good examples of this in, in New York recently, where a, a professor of, of a particular subject was was basically um, fired, essentially, because he made the course too tough. He was a tough guy. And this number of the students you know, were failing, and therefore they complained and they had him fired. You know, in his defense, many students and fellow staff members wrote in and supported him, but they still continued through with the firing him. And that that is the problem now. You know, we also with the advent of social media and all these websites, where you can go and you can see the grades people are entering the university. You can see what their grades they're getting when they leave. And you can see reviews from the students. The universities are paranoid about this. It's like a KPI for them. It's something they're tracking and they're monitoring and they're, they are working towards this. This is not just in the UK, but look in the US, this is, is even further ahead in, in the US. I just want to interrupt because, because the, the, the point that Robin made and Richard, your building upon really uh, manifests, I feel, in the rankings, mm. right? The 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 ranking tables, whether it's the Guardian or the Times or others, they have ranking tables and they get looked at really closely. Like they're annual and there's and there's like probably half a dozen of them. So they all they and they all generate very 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 similar rankings. The Oxbridge is either one, two, or three. But one of the eight, nine, or ten criteria for ranking is how many first class and upper second class degree do you get? Well, a lot. By the by the by the shape of those graphs, right? Yeah. And to your point earlier, there is no value add measurement. You can't yeah. ultimately easily measure value add. You can't at secondary school, and you can't even even before that. It is really really difficult to do. They've tried previously before you know, in the lower education establishments, but it's very very difficult. Yeah, I think that's just building on what you guys have said. I, I think the problem is there's probably three linked problems here. I mean, I mentioned Brian Kaplan, Freddie De Burr writes about this as well. So we're talking about kind of the relative positions of people when they go into university based on their school exams, they're going to be pretty much the same when they leave because people's absolute rankings don't move. Relatively, they'll all, they'll all go up a bit, but absolutely they won't change. So that's the first thing. The second thing is then grade inflation is seen as this massive battle where, and it's a good example of lazy thinking in the media, that um, you know people see grade inflation as a problem. It's, it's not at all. It's, mm. just, it's a symptom of what's going on. And then Charlie Munger um, aphorism where you know, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcomes. Well, the incentives here, as you guys have been saying, is we want to get more students, we want to get more money, we want to get more clout for the university, we want to go up the rankings, whatever. Actually, you can't really teach people better. You can maybe teach them in a more engaging way. You can maybe give them more support. You can maybe have, you know, a, a, a slightly better cheater, but a, a better teacher or lecturer isn't going to be 10x, you know, mm. the, 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 a, a good one. But they'll be better, but it's not like in a developer where there's that, there's that widespread. So, so what you find here is that there's, a, there's only a limited number of things that universities can do to influence their rankings. But, it, you know, it's printing grades, right? And as soon as you start mm. printing better grades it's like anything you start it's like debasing the currency you start debasing the credentials and because going back to rich's point that guy in in the us um well what he was trying to do was actually teach people but his, his, his students didn't want to be taught they wanted good grades and that's a fundamental difference so therefore going back to political points i think all, all the parties get to share the blame in the uk because of this push to get get everybody into university but essentially universities have turned themselves into a business they were about learning they now mm -hmm. turn themselves into a business and as soon as you start turning yourself into a business you have to figure out well, who's the consumer here? Well, absolutely, or well, the customer is absolutely the student, but they're also the commodity that universities are essentially selling access to the students, access to learning. They get the money off the back of it. 
who's profiting well the people who are profiting are probably not the lecturers and professors it's the booming admin staff the support staff the endowments mm. that, that that's what's actually happening here the, the universities need students to be able to make money to be able to get grades to go, to go and get power and the glory basically I would I would put a little bit of a counter there I don't think um, the administrative staff individually are on the lofty wages and salaries it might be the case that these establishments aren't efficiently run and therefore well run therefore there's lots and lots of them I, I kind of do agree that I don't think that the salaries of academics and the admin staff that run the universities and help them run are in, in any way high. Now that's not to say I, that I, chancellors, I, on the other yeah, hand, right yeah. at the top, there's some there's some quite astounding numbers for the people yeah. at the top of universities and how much they get paid. Hundreds of thousands of pounds, in fact. I think you'd be surprised in that it's not just the money, although the money is important. It's also the nice offices, the nice facilities. It's the, oh, we do all these courses. We've got, and that's one of the reasons why they're bringing in lots of people from abroad as well. Maybe the size of the cake hasn't increased that much in kind of monetary terms, but it has in all those other things. Mm. And it's just, it's the, it's the classic kind of problem in any organisation as it grows you end up with you know you hire somebody to look after a particular area they need an assistant the assistant needs an assistant then they all kind of mm. grow from there so I, and it's interesting, interesting see, yeah exactly so, so I do agree maybe it's not the amount of money these guys are making individually but it is that sort of back office part of university is absolutely booming so that Malcolm Gladwell article you sent around Rob that basically talked about their endowment being 53 billion dollars or something or whatever it was in 2021 in that article it basically mentions that it costs over 5 billion dollars a year to run Harvard 5 billion that is um, more money than it takes you know, some governments in countries use to run their countries, right? Repair the roads, all of the public offices and, and all the public staff that administer the entire country. So why is it that some of these universities like Harvard have just got these absolutely enormous cost bases? Somebody's getting the money or it's going somewhere, as, as Simon, you know, alluded to. So Mel really does have a, a real billion. bee in his bonnet with regards to the US universities, doesn't he? He, he, he makes very, very compelling yeah. cases and tells amazing stories, which he's world class at. And he certainly does highlight about why are millionaires and billionaires giving away millions to these top US universities and I shared the article you're referring to there's there's many yeah. others um, that are there but you're right some of the budgets are quite astronomical and, and the US is possibly where the UK will go eventually if you could bring up that slide that I, I sent you Rob with the first of all with the endowments for some of the universities I think it was 100 million to 250 million in one of the slides. These are UK universities aren't these they? These are UK universities now the reason we mentioned the US is because we expect that's where the US has been charging to go to university forever. And now basically the UK in the last two decades or whatever it is, has started that as well. So these are the endowments, their increases since 2013 up to 2021 for universities that have endowments of the size of 100 million to 250 million. And what you can clearly see there from these universities like University of Manchester and Glasgow and so on is there's a definite upward trend here. Um, so just for the people watching this podcast, universities get their money in three ways. They get it through tuition fees, you know, the £9,250. They get it through grants from the government and they also get the revenue from the growth of their endowment, okay? Um, so obviously the UK endowments here are quite small compared with those in the US. And we'll come on to that in a second. But Harvard has a, just to put it into context, Harvard has a $53 billion endowment, 53 billion, right? Which is more than the GDP of 120 plus countries. So there's the table of, of US universities and the size of their endowments. Just to put it into context, every single one of those universities in that list there has a larger endowment than Oxford and Cambridge in the UK. Oxford and Cambridge are in the six to maybe 7 billion range. So just for people who aren't listening rather than watching, so Harvard tops the list. Then Yale, Stanford, Princeton. And Princeton's a very special case, which we'll come on to in a second. Then you've got MIT, University of Pennsylvania, and so on. At the bottom of the list, you've got the University of Southern California, which still has an $8 billion, with a B, dollar. dollar. Yeah. endowment versus if we just go back to the other graph of the UK endowments I think the range of the graph was 250 million wasn't it at the top correct what you'll see here is the UK ones are increasing and if you follow that through over a 10 15 20 30 year period it's going to make a massive difference if you're growing at the stupid rates so here I plotted a few of these top ones in this list to show you where this is going so 
University of Manchester and Glasgow and stuff are going to be in the 350 million plus within 10 years. It's just, you know, phenomenal growth. Oxford and Cambridge grew 50% over the same time period. So the endowments went from somewhere in the region of 400 million, 4 billion, sorry, to the range of 6 billion. Now, universities are almost like private companies that can't distribute their profits. And that's why they build up this and this endowment and they are now well hold on massive donations let's be clear the the sizable growth will be investment returns so they this money isn't sitting there in an interest rate uh you know account savings account earning half a percent they are they're money they're managed by professional uh, managers either in-house or externally Externally. secondly and substantially alumni donate substantial amounts of money to your point they can't they can't make profits so in this in this the conventional sense in bad times they'll dip into these endowments when they're when their margins are negative in princeton in that example from that malcolm gladwell article princeton is now a university where it makes so much money from its endowment from purely from its endowment, not donations to it, from its endowment, that it no longer needs to accept grants, nor does it need to ex- mm. charge students. It literally, investment gains from the endowment is enough to completely fund the whole university and they would never need to charge. But they obviously, all these universities continue to charge and, and likely will do so. And there is actually Malcolm's article, it shows the number of times where Princeton is actually, the growth of its endowment hasn't been enough. The income from its endowment hasn't been enough. And that was like two years out of, I don't know, 15 years or something or 20 years. It, it's ridiculously small. So they're, they're set, sitting on increasingly large pots of cash that frankly should be invested for better facilities but, or better that, that, I was just going to say in the, in the UK and St Andrews is a really good example of this. There's been a huge growth in the number of foreign students as a percentage mm. and the reason I call out St Andrews is it's now over half over half the students really? at St Andrews are foreign students and to, to be clear just a cl- point of clarification St Andrews is a Scottish university yeah yes so English students are viewed as international students if you were Scottish you get free tuition fees but hold on a second at Scottish universities if you're English or Welsh you are treated as an inter- uh, I think you still pay the 9250 whereas an international international would be I don't know I think it's something like 17000 you're hitting on a very important point here Robin that is the universities and particularly Scottish universities are using um, overseas students to fund their um, fund the universities because they they're able to charge 21,000 pounds or more um, a year as opposed to 9,250 so you know if if you look at that obviously the profit margin is going to be that's all that's all increase in profit so this was my point really there there is a trend as, as, as this graph shows this graph shows in 2016 17 a historical number of international students in the UK was 450,000 in in the last what three four years that's grown by 35 percent to 605,000 in sort of three or four years it, it already had a, a period of growth leading up to where this yep. where this graph starts so as Richard points out they can charge more for foreign students and this just serves to perpetuate the evolution of universities into becoming businesses with customers where a student is actually a customer so so this then begs the question when i was uh, reading through this is are uk students uk residents who go to university in uk in the uk being short changed because the ethos of the university is now geared up to support that revenue generation from foreign students over really good education of domestic students. I think that's a really good point. So you, you end up with then a situation of you've got essentially, absolutely, you've got kind of poor value degrees that aren't really teaching you for the world's work. It's much more competitive out there anyway. You, you end up with people with you know, maybe lesser degrees from lesser universities, if one could be a bit rude. I've obviously mm. hired lots of people from all sorts of universities, but there's a perception there that some people will be just going into kind of low paid kind of non-graduate jobs with a bunch of debt because they're they're um you know without much chance of paying it off so then that comes on to perception of all degrees of poor value for money and then you know going back to you know the government and the media and kind of lazy thinking what they then go is okay well, let's try and rather than fixing the problem at source which is actually we should do more vocational training they then go oh we need to make university degrees more you know better value for money or what does that even mean right what does that even mean and again it's really difficult to manage to measure rather so what do you end up doing when you start mm. going okay well you know, what jobs are people moving into, which is, which is great as a metric, but actually not solving the problem at source, which has got a bunch of people who maybe shouldn't have gone to university. Now, the counter argument to that is 
going to university is is great for social mobility. So we sh- we're not saying that people mm. shouldn't, that nobody should go to university. We're just saying that it's much more of a clear choice. What do I want to go and do in my life? Because you can always go back to university, a university degree later on, right? Exactly. As long as you're getting into some sort of job where there's an apprenticeship or there's a training scheme or there's some clear progression. That's what you need, actually. And then the, the question I think should be, actually, does, does doing a degree, does that help me get into it? So, you know, going to do medicine, well, clearly, yes, you do. Going to do law, I imagine there's an advantage there because be, you still need to go and do some other degree. And actually starting to get people thinking about, actually, is this is this right for me? But just going back to what you guys have been saying, there's just a, a juggernaut now of, well, the universities are, are able to charge, therefore they do. They can get in foreign students, therefore they get more. They're growing it, turning it into a business. You know, an endowment that size, what, what have you actually turned your university into? It's kind of, it's basically like a fund of hedge funds that yep. just mm. happens to teach some people over there. Well, okay, great. But in what situation are you ever going to spend 53 billion? Yeah, yeah, that's right. But I just want to challenge you, Simon, on the point, yeah, you can always go back to university later on. I've just pulled up the UCAS uh, page, which shows applicants by age. And there is literally hardly anyone who goes to university i mean there are some obviously but the lines are so down near the baseline um of the graph that you can't actually tell how many it is without really digging deeper into the table that yeah, goes yeah. with it but it's very very few people get the opportunity to go to university as a mature student so really the vast majority you know it, it's it's kind of an accounting error almost the number of people who go as a mature student it's probably because they, they, they don't they, see any value in it though robin right I mean, that's, people that's do what I was well, I, well i don't know if it's just about value or opportunity opportunity because by then yeah exactly opportunity time commitments because by now you know you've got you, you may have a family you've got fixed overheads mortgages. in running your life mortgages exactly so it's harder to go so for a lot of people unless you're going to university to read law or medicine where you've got a very definite idea of what your career is going to be going in even though as you know someone like Rowan Atkinson shows you could then change during your, your, your university for you know there's a lot of people that go to university with a very definite career goal in mind Um, But there's also a lot that go and sort of read, you know, what I call those academic subjects, such as the English history, Latin, the the sort of the ones that don't have a direct relationship with a career path. And so for a lot of people, they're having to make very bold decisions, which can have a consequence on the rest of their life at an age when they really don't know what they want to do. And so for them, is there any value in the, the educational aspect or is it just the social and experiential benefit that they get? Well, my nephew went to university, did physics, or one of my nephews, should say, did physics. um, And then he became a physics teacher within three years. He's given up doing teaching and has now become a chartered accountant. After three plus years of being out in the workplace, he's now had to take a pay cut to go and do a, you know, a £28,000 starting graduate program for chartered accountancy. So even if you've done a degree, you don't necessarily know what you want to do afterwards. He did physics and he went and did physics teaching, but he changed his mind within three years. So it may be better to get out into the workplace and do something and then if you don't like it, go and do something else, right? That's entirely a possibility, right? In this yeah. modern day and age. That, and in addition to that, you've also got the number of people who switch courses as soon as they arrive at, at university as well. So My ex-business partner's daughter has switched courses twice at Edinburgh. That, that's racking up the bills. Uh, okay, as far as I hear it, there are five or six main reasons for someone goes to university, right? It's the learning. It's In theory, you're learning about a topic perhaps you're passionate about or you're learning cutting edge, but you're learning. You're, you're expanding your learning. It's the meeting people network potentially for the future although it's been highlighted but that perhaps the half-life of that network is quite short if that's the right word uh credentials we 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 started on that point early on it is a two one or a first in a solid solid subject from a decent university is a credential that helps you along with your career it's the social side it's the partying sure but it's the being thrown into the mix with lots of people same age but it's getting you away from home in a semi-structured way, but in a safe way, but getting you away from home as well, rather than staying in perhaps your hometown. And the reality is uh, there are improved job prospects from from going to university and having one of those decent degrees as well. Whether or not it is a good return on investment is another matter. What about, Simon, I think alternatives. We actually have done a terrible job here of talking about, well, what are the alternatives for people when they're 18? Yeah, and I I think I don't want this to come across as me thinking that 
you know, training, learning, etc., is a bad idea, right? Of course, it's a good, good idea, but you need to carry on doing that through, throughout your entire life. And I think there are, and we touched on it early, earlier on, I mean, in the olden days, um, you know, accountancy students were article clerks, they used to pay for their training, right? Because it was seen as the real value and real privilege. But nowadays, there are a range of other, other options. So there's a lot of careers, accountancy and legal in particular, but other knowledge careers where there's, you know, early access for school leavers. So in accountancy, you can go and do the AAT qualification, the Association of Accountancy Te- Technicians, before you go on to one of the accountancy institutes to do a, a full qualification there's lots of businesses like a multiverse that will put people in on apprenticeships there's lots of apprenticeship businesses there some of those used to be going into you know the classics kind of plumbing you know, carpentry all those things but actually again you can get into more of the knowledge work more professional services businesses more of the, the tech kind of tech businesses there's a range of what are known as kind of higher trained deployed providers so businesses like knowledge and fdm who you can join them as a grad they they'll get you into the likes of jp morgan or something like that where you just wouldn't be able to get into jp morgan directly but jp morgan are looking for a flow of um, you know smart motivated people who've had some you know enough training to be kind of business ready maybe you're trained as a a project management analyst maybe you're trained in a particular technology language and again going back to something we touched earlier on it's the cliche it's a cliche it's cliche for a reason that war for talent means that actually if you're trying to compete for people who've got mbas well that's really difficult so you're competing for people who've got degrees well that's really difficult as well so actually people are making as rich i think touched on people making links to the universities people are making links to the schools people are now back to wanting to hire school leaders you're trying to get access to talented staff you want to who you want to hire who are a good culture fit much much earlier in their career so actually whilst university still is a great credential i think employers are you know they're wanting to but they're also being forced to change because of that now apprenticeship degrees but that's another way of getting a degree right is you 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 ultimately work ibm does this dyson does this and others it's growing here in the uk and perhaps is a is a very valid way of doing it and, and that's com- that's combining kind of maybe it takes you five years you've got your study and you've got a job at the same time they'll pay for your course that's they'll pay right. you a salary and, and they give you time out. Absolutely, yeah. I think that yeah. is definitely... I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's certainly something we're tentatively exploring for my second child because it's there There are increasingly top-notch companies that are using that as another, another route. Yeah. I just pasted into our WhatsApp channel group something that my wife has um, shared with me this week, which actually is she reason she said, shared it with me is because of um, one of my daughters as maybe a different route for her. And it's this different type of degree. And her um, school that she goes to are uh, now starting to look into this quite seriously and, and present this as an option to their students. It's called a new interdisciplinary degrees and institutions. I don't know too much about it here, but obviously it's considered to be quite different, more practical call more aligned with the real world in some ways in theory it does involve studying at multiple different places around the world so the last one you you get a world bachelor in business you will have studied in los angeles hong kong and and milan and so on so you know maybe we can bring that up in the podcast video um, to show some of those as well and i'm sure more of these types of institutions will come about in the coming years basically in decades so we need to wrap up here i'm not sure we've concluded one way or the other but that, by its very nature, that's the point of this debate, discussion. Uh, no argument today, but it, these are complex subjects. It, it isn't mm. necessarily a black or white thing. You must go to university or you don't go to university. I think it depends on your child, right? It, and what, what type of subject they want to do. If I've said to my daughters, if you, if you come to me and ask me to fund your university and you want to do history, English, French, German, and, and those types of subjects, then, then I'm not going to do that. I, I want you to do a degree that I believe is going to be of use to you in the real world. Um, I'd rather you did an apprenticeship or some other route if if you're going to do what I would call a, a soft social sciences type subject. But not mm. to say there isn't value in humanities degrees. There's a lot of those out there, and um, Says he's we smoking. we we have <laughs> the, the the four of us. Let's be clear: have without doubt have an inherent bias to STEM subjects. Although Simon did a geography degree, he said, right? And yeah. uh, is that well, a that's humanities? A science, though, bro, that's a science. <laughs> okay, is that a science? Okay, wow. <laughs> I think so it is I, depending I, on which university you go to. I, I So I think it's clear to say, look, we have and we recognise that bias uh, towards STEM rather than the humanities. So I don't want to leave us with this. We're against all humanities degrees. Not no, at not, all. No, but not at all. Reality, it depends. It, the, yeah, it the depends. reality is the world runs and the, the future of society and the, and the world 
it's dependent on progress in, in STEM I subjects. Think it's a shame that we're, we're running out of time because I wanted to open the door on another sort of chapter of the topic, which is the pressure to go to university. Is that driven by what I consider to be something of a myth, or it could be reality, that employers, when they're looking to employ young people, favour those with degrees over those without degrees? And does that create this sort of self-fulfilling cycle that people feel pressure to go to university to read anything whatever it is yeah just so that they've got that stamp on their cv of having a degree and my view is that it's a shame it's a misconception because i don't have a degree i did i did get a BTEC national diploma actually it was one of those sort of aggregate courses which after my first few years in in in, in the workplace no one cared what my mm. education was yeah, at yeah. All. nobody does um, but I, I think I, I think I think that's a really interesting point there, Robin. So I, I, I think you're right. My my suspicion though is it's more companies are generally pretty bad at recruiting. It's, it's difficult mm. to hire people anywhere, right? I mean, whatever the stats is, seventy yeah. percent of, of hires work out, thirty percent go wrong. But actually because it's so difficult the HR departments kind of probably lazily fall back on, oh, here's a CV. We've got two CVs. One's got a degree, one hasn't. The fact you've got a degree is that credential that pushes out the people who haven't. So I think it's an element of what you said, plus it's easier for people to recruit to degrees, and the supply, but also the supply of people with degrees has increased massively. Yeah, and, mm. and that's not necessary. So, so it's yeah, it, it all kind of links together. I think the third thing as well. I don't, I don't know this. This is lazy speculation on my part, but. I think also there's a there's a generational thing here where people started going to university more maybe in the 70s. Those mm-hmm. kids are going to university, their kids are going to university in the 90s, mm-hmm. whenever it is. Actually, there's now there's an expectation built in that there wasn't 40 years ago that you will go to yeah, university. So. 40 years ago, you might be going to an apprenticeship, you get, but you, or you'd be going into firms that had training schemes, right? Or you'd be going into kind of skilled manual jobs that you were taught how to do things. So what, even, you know, 40 years ago, my guess would be that most people were taught something in a job. That's probably dropped off of this as well. Okay. Yeah, my wife, my uh, wife uh, bro, I've that. got to call it. We've run out no, of time. Can, oh, can, I just, can, I, can I just say, can I just say one thing? Because I made this note last night. <laughs> so my, my view is this very strongly and i think this is a life view whether you go to university or not you just need to be good at what you do and yeah. you need to work hard and that's it yeah okay. totally agree. i think uh i think we'll we'll doff our caps to that okay so look, that's a wrap from us uh I, we hope you've enjoyed today's episode and gained new appreciation on a complex subject and like most as we've already said it's not black or white it depends on many many factors so thanks to my fellow co-hosts robin richard and simon We look forward to welcoming you all to our next episode. And please remember to like and subscribe to the Paragoni podcast. And as always, it's about emphasizing discovery, not defense. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye.